After two years of joint military and DOD planning, an evaluation of new short-range air intercept missile concepts, including the all-aspect IR missile and air combat maneuvering tactics, was conducted at Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. Navy F-14 Tomcats and Air Force F-15 Eagles took part in the exercise against a common adversary, the F-5E. The tests, known by the acronym ACEVAL AIMVAL, are complete now. And while there are varied conclusions to be drawn with regard to their primary goals, a funny thing happened to the F-14 on its way through the trials. Designed at another time for another mission, the swing-wing, long-range interceptor more than held its own in the close-in 30-mile air combat arena at Nellis, excelled in several key performance areas, and in terms of operational readiness, proved to be a very maintainable aircraft. Tactically, the word is out. The best way for fighter aircraft to deal with a lethal all-aspect missile is its standoff distances, long-range identification, and long-range kill with launch and leave missiles. That's what it's going to take to be prepared for the future. Because the new infrared missiles can be fired head-on, or even at an angle to the target, maneuvering is less important. And getting behind the other guy is no longer an essential ingredient for successful air combat. It's a situation that, for the first time, will radically change the course of aerial tactics. We have always approached the killing of another aircraft in the same way. Uh, we've had to identify it visually, and then we had to maneuver with it, and finally, uh, at about 95% of the cases, you end up uh, in, a, in a 15 or 20 degree cone behind the guy, firing whatever kind of a weapons uh, that you have at him from the rear. Now, the new all-aspect missile gives you the capability to fire at somebody head on. And that's very, very important because it extends the, uh, the weapon system effectiveness area. It sets up a requirement for you to identify early and to fire early. What you've got to do now is quit thinking about 1,100 feet uh, and a gun kill or an AIM-9 kill and start th thinking in terms of getting a kill at 50 miles, something that's certainly outside of his weapon system capability. ACEVAL AIMVAL took advantage of recently developed highly sophisticated computer technology which enables fighter pilots of supersonic aircraft to fly realistic missions in a simulated combat environment. Even missile launches and gunfire can be simulated, and their flight paths tracked from release to impact. All the action at the range is monitored by a network of unmanned solar power tracking stations, which are fed by airborne instrumentation pods attached to the aircraft. With the same captive carriage characteristics of a Sidewinder, this missile carries no warhead. It's a self-contained electronic system that continuously measures and transmits position, velocity, and weapons data to the ACMI control center where it's displayed in real time from just about any angle or point of view. Hundreds of thousands of data bits can be handled within the system every second, and it's all available for instant recall, evaluation, briefing, and debriefing, an intensive training experience that greatly accelerated the learning curve in combat tactics. We explored all the little corners of tactics that we hadn't really looked at before, and we could do it on an almost hour-by-hour -hour basis. You could sit down right as you're debriefing the particular hop you've just been blown away on and figure out a way uh, to go out and counter that. Fighter crews at the Nellis evaluations were all expert sticks and tacticians, some with combat experience in Vietnam, some out of Top Gun. The Blue Force was comprised of Air Force and Navy crews who flew the F-15s and F-14s, respectively. The aggressor Red Force flew the F-5E, an agile fighter similar in size and performance to the MiG-21. The basic rules of engagement. Radar cannot be turned on before entering the range. Short-range missiles, AIM-7F Sparrow, and guns only. No Phoenix. 
positive visual identification required before clear to fire. All scenarios limited to 30 mile arena with entry from specified start points. In this engagement, two F-14s will take on two F-5s. We'll charge towards uh, the northern bogey, okay? And you say, I'll give us the altitude and so on. I'm going to remain about 22,000. I'll try to lock this guy up. You press, go ahead and turn in on this guy. Try to blow him away, and I'll chase the guy that's, that's dragging back toward the rope as this guy tries to hook me. You ought to be able to get him before he gets me. Brace for the kill book. Brandon. Hit plate. And wooden hit plate. To the sky. Not shut. Wouldn't kind of light? After each trial, the entire engagement is thoroughly debriefed. Despite their success in this engagement, there was no way F-14 crew members were going to take the F-5E lightly, not as long as she was carrying the all-aspect head-on missile. A far less sophisticated airplane, the F-5E suddenly became a very dangerous competitor at the Nellis range when armed with a launch and leave AIM-9L. I think what people have to recognize is that we are in a very limited in-game scenario here, but we're talking about visually identifying the other aircraft that we're fighting before we're allowed to shoot. By the time you got a positive identification, you were inside the lethal head-on envelope of that IR weapon. So a normal uh, tendency for uh, fighter pilots would be to design their tactics uh, so that they didn't get into that lethal environment. However, we had to get into that lethal environment to do the test. We tried to act like we thought we would act in combat, uh, with, the, with the big exception that we wouldn't have gone into most of these fights. Uh, you get killed too often. Your survivability is about uh, three missions. It's nice to go out man to man and say, I beat him flying and get your hands going and work it way in at his six, but you might not have a chance to do that if he's carrying an all aspect threat. You need a standoff capability. Standoff capability is one thing, to be able to launch a missile successfully outside the range of the enemy's weapons. But there's still the requirement in many scenarios for positive visual identification, since there's little advantage in having a long range missile if you don't know who you're shooting at. In the F-14 itself, we've had for a number of years the capability to kill another aircraft at 50, 60, 75 miles. The problem has been we don't know who's out there. 
And that's the first thing that any other airplane driver will tell you when you start bragging about the fact that the F-14 will do things that uh, his airplane won't do. He shrugs his shoulders and says, uh, yeah, that's fine, but uh, who the hell knows what's out there? With the installation of a television sighting unit, the F-14 has taken the first giant step toward long-range target identification. An electro-optical system, the TVSU helped F-14 crew members positively identify the much smaller F-5 long before being visually detected themselves and at distances significantly greater than the naked eye, often maintaining a lock on the F-5 even through ground clutter and evasive maneuvering. We're always positive what we're shooting at way out. And in fact, during the program, in order to keep us honest, uh, the people running the test at uh, various times ran intruder aircraft through flying the same type of tactics that the F-5s would, trying to confuse us, just making sure we're playing the game straight. And TVSU worked for us every time. But you can also uh, tell a lot about what the opponent's doing. And that's important to know exactly when he turns into you, for example, if he's running away. And you can't always pick that up just by watching a V sub C on the HUD. You can visually track one target and radar track another target simultaneously. And with a long range VID, sometimes you'll have one radar blip on your scope and you won't know if the, how many there are. You slave the TV if there's enough contrast there, sometimes you'll pick out two sometimes as much as four if they're in tight formation trying to mask their IFFs or the number of force mix. Uh, against the F-5s over land, it was very easily, an ID was very easily achieved in the heart of the AIM-7F envelope and that did enable us to uh, achieve sparrow kills and exit the arena prior to being exposed to the F-5 and his AIM-9L. And consequently, they're in the sparrow envelope uh, before they even have a tally hole. The TVSU has also proven very effective for surface surveillance, positively identifying potential targets on land and sea. To take full advantage of the TVSU, however, F-14 pilots at Nellis could have used a launch and leave missile if the rules had permitted. Fire and turn away while the weapon continues to the target on its own. Hanging around to see the weapon home got to be very risky. The F-14 with the TVSU would, would uh, pick up the F-5, fire a missile at him, and, uh, and it would look as though he had the kill in the bag. But uh, because you had to track the uh, AIM-7 and it was not launch and leave, the two aircraft continued to close until the F-5 could see the F-14. At that stage of the game, he fired a, an AIM-9L that is launch and leave. And uh, even though he's destroyed himself, the, uh, the missile goes on and takes the F-14 with him and you end up with a one-to-one -one kill. And we just can't do that. We know from uh, uh, from the way uh, Russia is producing aircraft, that we're, wherever we go and under whatever circumstances we fight them, we know we're going to be outnumbered. And for that reason, we've got to have better quality. If the AIM-7 had been a launch and leave missile, or if he could have, had, uh, could have been able to fire uh, his AIM-54 Phoenix missile, which is launch and leave, the situation would have been entirely different. Technology will soon catch up with the advanced F-14 weapon control system. Contracts have been awarded to achieve long-range aircraft identification using several different approaches. Taking advantage of the versatile laser beam and coherent optical processing. Microelectronics, memory chips that can store, compare, and arrange data almost instantaneously. And the next generation radar systems. Finally, a computer will provide multiple correlation of all identification systems telling us exactly what kind of airplane is out there and opening the way to full use of the only long-range aircraft weapon system in the defense inventory. There's really only one airplane on the market uh, today that, uh, and in fact, there's only one airplane even in the airplanes that we're contemplating building that can take advantage of the, uh, uh, of the ability to identify at longer ranges, and that's the F-14. It puts it literally in a class by itself. For all the sophisticated electronics and high performance features inherent in a modern weapon system, one of the most important considerations is still operational readiness, the OR rate, maintainability, keeping flight schedules. Because no matter how capable, if an airplane is not up when you need it, it's not doing anyone any good.
At Nellis, the flight schedules were tough and demands on the aircraft heavy. Logistics control came out of Miramar, but a small network of shops and supply centers set up very close to F-14 flight operations at Nellis and manned by sailors with minimal contractor assistance carried out the day-to-day, minute-by-minute support role. It was a people-to-people -people thing that kept several steps ahead of all the paperwork with direct communications whenever possible. Uh, Mandy 43, this is Mandy Maintenance. I understand inbound, up and up. Because of the extensive built-in tests and onboard checkout features, air crews were able to continuously monitor F-14 systems in flight often radioing problems ahead so that maintenance people were prepared to respond as soon as the aircraft returned. RMO failure on some computer system transfers to Falls. Roger that, 4 2. That guy, the first one, I could see. Every flight was immediately debriefed. Every gripe discussed face to face. The result? The F 14 demonstrated exceptional maintainability day in and day out, with an operational ready rate as high as 95% some months, better even than the veteran F-5. We've flown approximately 1,400 sorties without a maintenance aboard. That's a better record than any airline in the world can maintain. Our people are not unique. Uh, this situation is not unique. Uh, you can go back to Miramar, or you can go to Oceana and you can get another 118, 119 enlisted men for about the uh, same talent level that we came here with and give them the same tools and they can do the same job we've been doing. I never went out to get an airplane that I didn't fly. And that, that's something I've, I've been flying both F-4s and uh, F-14s for about 10 years now and that's kind of unheard of. We'd come back from the hop and it'd still be hard up and ready to go again. Anytime you can maintain a better than 90% OR rate, I don't care how good your support is, uh, that speaks pretty well for the aircraft. In terms of aerial combat, both the F-14 and the F-15 performed impressively in the short-range visual environment at night. However, the F-14 was operating in an area that represented only about 25% of its total capability. Even so, the Tomcat proved quite adept close in, outmaneuvering and outrunning the F-5, and hanging tough against the all-aspect missile. There's very little area that you can use in tactics to improve them to handle an all-aspect IR-equipped threat as we face up here. I think you've got to have hardware improvements now to handle that kind of threat. We need an airplane that can, uh, uh, that can fire, uh, such as the F-14, can fire uh, a half a dozen uh, Phoenix missiles on one pass and, and hit aircraft or cruise missiles or whatever the threat may be. Uh, at different altitudes, going different directions, different speeds, and that sort of thing. And I think that uh, it's a unique capability that, uh, that we've had since uh, for the last four or five years, but one that is only now coming into its real importance because of the identification problem. The lessons learned from ace Val aim Val will be the basis of much discussion and procurement decisions for years to come. Although the scenarios were limited, and the realism compromised somewhat by the fact that no one, after all, was firing real missiles, few can discount the tremendous technology which made it all possible, or the dedication and expertise of a group of people who went all out to do a first-rate job in a very demanding environment, or the excellent performance of missile and aircraft systems that will be the first line of this nation's defense for years to come.